Hello and welcome to worship. Uh, today is the 22nd Sunday after the Festival of Pentecost. And as, as our theme today, we'll be worshiping under the assurance that the resurrection produces comfort for the dying. And we'll be taking a look at Luke chapter 20 and some interesting words that Jesus had about the resurrection when a question was directed his way by a group of people known as the Sadducees. So we'll be getting into that for our discussion today. But let's begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear fellow saints of God waiting to join the heavenly chorus and to someday look into the eyes of Jesus. There are those who proclaim and even openly boast that they don't bother concerning themselves with the future because they're too focused only on the present. Whereas it is biblical to not worry about the future, that doesn't necessarily mean that we would that we shouldn't prepare for it. And if you have an idea of what the future may hold for you, such knowledge is going to be beneficial for you in the present. Let me use a couple examples. For example, if you know that you're going to receive a substantial bonus check from your place of employment, well, you'll be less concerned about that unexpected bill that just came up. Or if you're flying to the Caribbean, you'll be less concerned about the forecast that tells you to prepare for freezing temperatures that are coming your way. And as a Christian, if you know there's a brand new, much more wonderful life awaiting you in the future, you're going to be better equipped to handle the ups and downs of your life here on this earth. And that's really the message I wish to share with you today. Christ, our Savior, has washed us clean of our sins by his blood, making us righteous in the eyes of our Heavenly Father. And with such righteousness, we are now able to share in the victory that Jesus won over sin, death, and the devil, meaning that we will also share in the eternal blessings that come with that victory. So today, join me in looking forward to eternity, looking forward to eternity. Two points I want to bring out today, what we look forward to, and then why we can look forward to it. The words before us this morning take place on Tuesday of Holy Week, just three days before Jesus would be crucified. And the leaders of the Jew, they were burning the midnight oil, trying to dig up something they could use against him. And here in Luke chapter 20, we read of a number of questions they hurled at him, trying to deceive him, to get him to slip up or say something to lessen his popularity with the people. In verse 19, we are told this, the teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately, but they were afraid of the people. 
And then in the verse right in front of our text, we hear them trying to trick him into speaking against the government. But Jesus was on to them. And he gave that well-known answer, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. So they moved on to another topic. But the first thing that catches our attention is the group that was posing the question to Jesus in our text for this morning. In verse 27, some of the Sadducees, and here's a key thing to know about them, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus with a question. The Sadducees, or they were, they were few in number, but they had a great deal of power in the Jewish governing body known as the Sanhedrin. They had a great deal of influence with Herod and the other Jewish kings, and yes, even with the Roman governors. One of their responsibilities was maintaining the temple. But then there's the part that makes us question their choice as religious influences of the influencers of the day. That part about the Sadducees not believing in the resurrection. And really, not only that, they also denied the existence of angels. And they only accepted as truly uh, God's word the first five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I imagine if we were to try to compare the Sadducees with, with people today, we'd say, well, they're like the rationalists that we have. Um, among us who refuse to believe anything that they cannot see with their eyes or understand with their minds. These Sadducees were so wrapped up with the here and now, they couldn't really buy into this concept of life after death, what we would call the hereafter. And so when we hear that what they were asking Jesus, it's easy to see the Sadducees had not come necessarily to sit at Jesus' feet and learn but to really question him so that they might find fault with his teaching. And so listen now to that hard believe situation they present to Jesus that actually leads up to their question. We pick it up in verse 28. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and have children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second, and then the third married her, and in the same way, the seven died, leaving no children. And finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, which, remember, the Sadducees did not believe in, but they said, in, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were married to her? Okay, there, there isn't any kind of sincerity in the Sadducees calling Jesus teacher, which was really a term of respect. No, they were coming to him with a foolish question about a situation that would never really happen. So what was their intent? Well, to make the teaching of the resurrection look ridiculous, to mock it, along with Jesus himself, by asking something about the resurrection that could not be answered logically. In so doing, the Sadducee, Sadducees believed that they, could, they had come up with a way to discredit Jesus as a teacher in front of the people. Well, if you want to give them some credit, they did know their scriptures, at least the first five books of Moses, and the Sadducees were using Moses as a reference, bringing up what was known as the Leveret Law. That was a law that Moses' time was established so that a man's name might not die out if he died childless. The first male child born to the dead man's wife and his brother would then legally carry the name of the deceased brother. So they were bringing up something that was well known amongst the Jewish people. But by asking this seemingly unsolvable question about the resurrection, again, in which they did not believe, the Sadducees show just how foolish and faithless they were. You know, even today, there are those who try to make God look foolish by asking questions like, if God is so all powerful, then why doesn't he just put an end to all the evil in the world? 
the one we mentioned in Bible class a few weeks ago. If God can do anything, can he make a rock so heavy that he even, even he can't lift it? Well, according to Matthew's recording of this account, Jesus states that the reason the Sadducees didn't get it was because they did not know the scriptures or the power of God. In other words, they did not have faith. But Jesus doesn't just ignore their question as silly as it might have been. Instead, he gets right to the point in showing the faulty logic of these Sadducees. We're going on in verse 34 and following. The people of this age, Jesus says, marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection." So Jesus really is saying there's no need for him to answer the question because the world to come is not going to be the same as this world. Marriage is an institution for this world only, so their question is pointless. <laughs> let's call a time out here. You might be wondering this. Let's, let's just back up a bit. Did Jesus say that there's no marriage in heaven? Yes, he did. Does that get your mind spinning just a bit? Do you find that troubling? Well, here's some sound advice someone gave to me a long time ago. I want to pass on to you. We have to be careful not to speculate too much on what eternity will be like. Instead, we can only stick to what Scripture tells us. In Revelation chapter in Revelation chapter twenty one and twenty two, we learn that heaven will be a place of perfect happiness and contentment. We assume that we will be able to most likely recognize each other in eternity. If we're going to use as an example the fact that the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration they recognize Moses and Elijah, and and even Jesus after his resurrection they recognized him as their Lord. Add to that fact, there really is no clear indication in Scripture that we will not be able to recognize our loved ones in heaven. So there are some encouraging signs that we will. But no marriage? And no family? Well, here on this earth, the closest and most cherished relationships we have are those between a husband and wife, followed closely by those between parents and children. But Jesus says things, but Jesus says things will change in eternity, but will change for the better. In the life to come, he says we will be God's children. In heaven, family ties will no longer be important since all Christians will be one family, God's family, united in heavenly bliss. It's still okay to talk about a heavenly reunion with loved ones who have gone before us. But do keep in mind that in eternity, any reunion with loved ones will take a back seat to the fact that we'll be with the Lord. And all of us will be together with him in one great heavenly family. And then Jesus adds, just like the angels, that relationship will never be interrupted by death. We'll never die in heaven. Our heavenly family is going to last forever. Well, are you still bummed by the thought of no marriage in heaven? Well, don't be. You'll be just fine when you get there because you'll be with Jesus. You'll be without sin. And that's what we look forward to. The specifics beyond that really don't matter. And, and trying to use the joys that we experience here on earth, such as marriage and family, to, to define or describe the joys that we hope to experience in heaven, well, that only ends up limiting what God has prepared for us. See, living as God's children in the age to come will far outshine the highest joys of marriage and family in this age. So just be patient and excited. I guarantee you won't be disappointed. 
I really can't let you go yet without sharing with you why we can look forward to eternity. And it all centers around Jesus. Back to those Sadducees. If they wanted to quote Moses in making their argument, well, Jesus could do the same. And so he does just that, verses 37, 38. In the account of the bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. You see, at the time the Lord was speaking to Moses from the burning bush, Moses referred to him as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of whom had already died. Moses didn't say that God was or used to be the God of these patriarchs, but he expresses the belief that God is still their God, even though they passed away. And so Jesus, by referring to Moses, a prophet accepted by the Sadducees, proved that the resurrection of the body and the immortality of the soul were truly teachings of Scripture. And the Sadducees, well... They were foolish to believe otherwise. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, Jesus says. What was his point? Well, in God's eyes, no one really dies because there is a resurrection that follows our departure from this life. And that's why Jesus says to him, all are alive. You and I, we witness death here on this earth. We grieve over the separation that follows. But to God, our loved ones who die in the faith never really die, but they remain alive. And he'll see you and me the same way when we die, not condemned to hell or not even simply ceasing to exist somehow, but ready to begin the life he always intended for us to live with him for all eternity. And the reason you and I can look forward to such an existence because the blood that Jesus shed on the cross as a sacrifice for the sins of all mankind enables us to look forward to eternal life in heaven. It's really that simple. If you want hope for the future, you need to look to the past to see what Jesus did for you and then leave in the past the sins that once condemned you because the blood of Jesus has covered them all. He paid the price for your salvation, giving you freedom, peace, hope, and the ability to look forward to eternity. Because you no longer have to drag yourself through life, burdened by guilt and overwhelmed by failure. If you and I know what awaits us, life has new meaning, and we have a new motivation for living. Because God has redeemed us and delivered us from death. Because that of that, we can live for him now, knowing that we're going to live with him in eternity. And it's all because of Jesus. I know there are some of you out there who like to record your favorite team's football game when you're unable to watch it live. Uh, my brother Roger this past week told me that he does this with our favorite team, the Detroit Lions. But he always looks ahead to see what the final score is before deciding whether to watch it or not. Because if the Lions lose, which seems to happen the vast majority of the time, he says he doesn't watch the game that he recorded. But on that rare occasion when they might win, such as could very much happen today as they take on the woeful Packers, then he says he'll take the time to watch it. For him, he says it's easy. It's just more enjoyable watching when he knows the outcome will be in his favor. Well, do you get the point? Because of Jesus, we know the outcome of our life here on this earth. We know it will be in our favor. Because of Jesus, we can live out our days knowing that no matter what comes our way, no matter how grim some days may be, in the end, we win. Because of Jesus, we're able to fast forward through this life to what comes next, to the place prepared for us by Jesus himself in the mansions of heaven. And because of Jesus, and because of what we know awaits us in the end, we can live confidently in peace and joy until we get there. Amen.
And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding may keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord of life, on this holy day, receive the praise of our thankful hearts for Christ's victory over sin, death, and the grave. And on this day, when he rose from the dead, we acknowledge again with great joy the hope of our own resurrection. You gave your Son to be rejected by sinners, that we sinners might be welcomed into your kingdom. Preserve your church in this life won for us by Christ. Grant faithfulness to the preaching of your word and the administration of your sacraments, and let your people receive these gifts with penitence and faith. Grant to us, Heavenly Father, those good works that flow from faith in your precious Son. Grant that everything your children do in thought, speech, and action would bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus Christ. O God, aid your children to resist temptation. Send your Holy Spirit to guard and keep us, that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. Bless all in authority over us, especially those who work to bring peace and justice, that they may be inclined to your will and walk according to your commandments. Grant wisdom to our citizens and courage and competence to our leaders. Lord God, you promise everlasting joy to your people. Remember all in trying circumstances, the sick, the suffering, the dying, and the mourning. Comfort them with your divine promises and grant your healing peace. O Lord, you are not a God of the dead, but of the living. With you live all those who have departed this life in faith. Receive our thanks for their witness. And lead us also to be found faithful and be declared worthy of eternal life with them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. God's blessings to you this coming week. Um, I pray that as he has promised, he watches over you and takes care of you no matter what may come your way. Always look forward to eternity. Keep your eyes focused on the life that is to come. And the life that you go through here on this earth, you'll know it's in God's hands. And thankfully, you'll take care of anything that may come your way. If I can be of service to you in any way, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Otherwise, take care. Look forward to bringing you God's message again next week. Thanks.